Hi, I'm a fire ecologist, or at least I used to be. Uh, recently, I've been working in wildland firefighter occupational health. And to be honest, it's one of the most professionally and personally rewarding things I've done to date. Tonight, we've heard a lot about resilience and a lot of excellent talks. Um, and we both, we all know resilience and burnout. These are both words we use in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and we have intuitive meanings associated with them. But as an ecologist, they have very specific meanings. Resilience is the idea that an ecosystem is able to withstand a disturbance or a change. And burnout is a really fire-specific word that we use when we're talking about firing operations. It's the idea that we're creating defensible space between ourselves and an oncoming fire, usually using fire to clear surface materials. Those themes will become more obvious in a minute. So I'm gonna take you back about 6,000 years, but I'll fast forward real quick. Wildland fires have been a part of our North American landscape since the last ice age. They're really integral in stimulating plant growth, keeping our grasslands and forests healthy, and you know, are super important in overall management and silviculture. Over the last 100 years or so, though, two factors have really collided to create an issue where wildfire behavior has changed. The first of those is historic fire suppression, where we've taken fire off the landscape. And the second is climate change. And as climate change and fire suppression have collided, we've seen changes in fire behavior, fire intensity, fire severity, fire unpredictability, the acreage has grown, and the overall length of the fire season has also increased. This means that wildfires are now oftentimes at the forefront of our national conversation. We see images of smoke, we see images of flames, and we hear stories about people being displaced from their homes. What we're hearing a lot less of, though, are stories about wildland firefighters, those individuals that stand between us by doing fire management and fire suppression, stand between us and a blaze. So I want to introduce you to this population. Federally, there's about 15,000 wildland firefighters in the United States. They come from a variety of educational backgrounds, some from conservation management, others outdoor recreation. Others started their whole career and stayed in fire. But what really unites this diverse group of people is how they self-describe. They're hardworking. They like being outside. They like a challenge. That's really good because their job is all three. To give you an idea what this looks like, a wildland firefighter can be going about their normal life and get a call, and in less than 48 hours, they're at a whole new location, maybe California, Oregon, wherever there's a fire. While they're there, they'll spend 14 days straight working, working 16-hour days, sleeping in a tent, eating less than healthy food, and hiking eight to 10 miles uh, a day on average. So it's really physically strenuous, to say the least. They can also repeat this cycle over and over after taking two-day breaks throughout an entire fire season. It's hard and it's strenuous for firefighters, but it's also really challenging for wildland fire families. I'm in a, about a 20-year relationship now, with a wildland firefighter, and we've got two wonderful nine-year-old kids together. And to say it's been a challenge would be an understatement. We had conflict associated with his job, strain on our relationship associated with you know, trying to make the decisions that we needed to make when his job made those really unpredictable. And these conflicts and the strain and this anxiety that came with it felt really unique, like I was doing something wrong in the relationship. But, after talking to wildland fire families and spouses and partners across the country, collecting my own data, turns out my family is anything but unique when it comes to those factors. Most wildland fire families report high levels of conflict. They report financial strain, difficulties reintegrating a partner when they would turn home from these long deployments, and lots of anxiety and worry associated with their partner's job. So it was really great to know that it's not something wrong with me, it's something wrong with the system. It's important, though, for me to make the point that wildland firefighter health and safety should matter to every single one of us. This occupation stands between us and the next big natural disaster, and that's it. If we don't have a robust and healthy workforce that's able to put out these fires, we will pay the price. I mentioned this job is really strenuous. It's also really risky. On average, 13 firefighters die annually uh, on the job, while fighting fires. And we've learned a lot about the fire behavior that causes some of these fires to you know, result in mortalities, but what we've learned a lot less about over the past several years 
is the social, emotional, mental health factors that are contributing to how the occupation functions. So my team and I, and I want to say team in the most emphatic way, we decided to change this. In 2022 and 2023, we conducted national scale surveys of wildland firefighters, and we asked them about their morale, their retention, their recruitment, their mental health, their physical health, so many questions. And um, I'd like to share what I think are the most poignant results of that study this evening. The first three slides you'll see deal with wildland firefighter safety. So this slide's asking about work-related illnesses or injuries. So a work-related illness might be something like emphysema in the long term. A work injury could be anything from a burn to a dislocated shoulder to um, a bum knee. What we saw was over, we had one, over 1,000 uh, respondents to the survey, and what we saw was that 65% of them had experienced this. When we considered interpersonal safety, this is the ability to feel safe around the people that you work with, we found that one in 10 men and one in five women had experienced physical violence or sexual assault while working on the fire line. This is an important result because wildland firefighters work in a crew structure, and those crews deploy often to remote and isolated areas. We also considered rest as part of safety. They're already working 16-hour days, so we ask, how often are you working more than 16-hour days in a 14-day shift? At least three times for most people. And this really impairs your ability to perform cognitively and physically. And it creates a safety issue when you're not working at your max in these situations. This slide is probably the hardest to present of all of this. We considered mental health. And we know that risky jobs bring with them a higher risk of mental health disorders. But our results were, I think, striking. Over half of our respondents had anxiety or depression associated with or worsened by their career in wildland fire. A full quarter had substance abuse issues or post-traumatic stress disorders, again, worsened or caused by their work in wildland fire. And one in three fire dispatchers and one in five wildland firefighters had suicidal thoughts or ideations associated with or caused by their work in wildland fire. I wanna sit with that number for a second. One in five wildland firefighters, one in three wildland fire dispatchers. I didn't put the data up here, but we also asked wildland fire dispatchers how, how many of them knew um, a wildland firefighter who died by suicide, and one in two, half of them, knew somebody personally who had committed suicide while working in wildland fire. It's important to say here, too, we can't just be reactive to these things. These need proactive solutions. We also considered financial strain. So we asked, how many hours of overtime do you need just to meet the bills? On average, the starting salary for wildland firefighters is $15 an hour, and oftentimes they're working in some of the most expensive areas in the country. California, there's a lot of fires, not cheap to live there. 600 hours was the average number of overtime hours that folks needed just to pay the bills. If you're working 52 weeks a year, that's over 10 hours of overtime a week, so it's pretty impressive. It's probably not surprising to see this statistic at this point. Wildland fire families divorce at three times the rate of uh, the average American household. And that's likely exacerbated by the data we're showing here. When we considered work-life balance, we found that fire families often reported they weren't able to attend important events. They weren't able to make the kids' soccer game or plan ahead or build a future because of the stochasticity that is involved in their career. So you can see why I use the word burnout. The Mayo Clinic defines burnout using this, uh, this list of criteria. A lack of control at work, lacking clear expectations at work, having conflicts at work, having too much work, having poor work-life balance, and lacking support both socially and within your job. So given the high propensity for burnout in this group, we had to offer some solutions. And so my team came up with five that we think could make a really good difference. First, we've got to fix the pay issue. We need to increase the base pay to a living wage. If you have a base pay that's at a living wage, then you're able to work less, spend more time with your family, and that's going to take care of some of these issues. We need to recognize and acknowledge that there is a significant strain on families. By recognizing it, talking about it, this builds a foundation to start doing something about it. We need to make sure that healthcare is accessible to all employment levels and at all times. Right now, part-time federal employees, of which about a quarter of wildland firefighters are, aren't eligible for health care benefits. 
And when folks are on the fire line, they're in remote and distant places. Telehealth's not always an option, but mental health care needs to be accessible in those locations too. We need to make sure we're combating unhealthy and unsustainable work-life balance. We do this in two ways. Again, we raise that base pay, and second, we make sure that the workforce is fully staffed so people don't have to work extra. And fifth, we have to work within the community to rectify these issues with safety and violence, and that's gonna take top-down and bottom-up approaches. So this evening, I'm asking you as an audience to help me reclaim this word burnout. I don't want burnout to be something that happens to wildland firefighters. I don't want it to be an occupational risk. I want it to be something they do and we do with them to create a safety zone and buffer them against these potentially negative effects. So it's a win-win for all of us. It's gonna increase our community resilience. It's gonna increase our ecosystem resilience too. And it's really important to say that change in this requires all of us. There are great groups like the Grassroots Wildland Firefighters, the Wildland Firefighter Foundation, that are working to make legislative and policy changes and working within fire to make changes. But real change will take authentic and vocal investment from each and every one of us. Thank you. <laughs>